During a lifetime of Christian ministry, I've often had occasion to suggest that the Old Testament looks forward to Jesus, that the Gospels describe his life and ministry, and that the Epistles then explain how it is that Jesus fulfills, or one might suggest fills full, the Old Testament scriptures. This is especially true of Paul's letter to the Romans. For it was the question of the way in which the Old Testament faith related to the age in which Jesus had come that was dividing the church in Rome and had prompted Paul's correspondence with them. Now when we come to the final words of Paul's letter in today's epistle, Romans chapter 16 verses 25 to 27, uh, we, f we encounter words that are expressed in the form of a benediction. But the Apostle is also drawing his earlier thoughts to a close. Benediction it may be. Equally, it is his conclusion. But it follows too that what he has to say is especially relevant to us as we gather virtually, as it may be on this occasion, on the last Sunday before Christmas. Put in the form of a question, we might rightly ask of Paul the question, why is Jesus' coming so important to us? In reply, the Apostle makes a number of important points. First, he simply reminds us that the message he has been teaching was good news. In a year shrouded in bad news and fake news, his comment is especially welcome. The coming of Jesus is good news good news par excellence, and it is not fake news. Then we notice that this good news, as Paul says, is, and I quote, about Jesus Christ, end quote. It centres on him. Indeed, he is himself, as far as Paul is concerned, the good news. Now, we must be careful we do not pass over this phrase, too quickly. The combination of the two names is not accidental. It is done with forethought because the latter, which is a title, reminds us that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And then his name Jesus, as we know from the angelic revelation to Joseph, described for us in Matthew 121, was given to him because he was, quote, to save his people from their sins. And here is the reason why these verses are so relevant to us today. This good news about Jesus Christ came after what Paul describes as long ages past. It came over only after millennia in which the human race was plunged into a deep moral darkness occasioned by the failure of our first parents a darkness characterised by the loss of intimacy with God and of life lived in the shadows of divine wrath. But those ages were not without beacons of hope. The eternal God, the God who is the same in every age, had been speaking through his mouthpieces, the prophets, of a time to come when the tragic human condition would be met by the in intervention, excuse me, of a Messiah, even of God himself. The manner of the fulfilment of these promises was shrouded in what calls here a mystery. The plan was clear enough, but the details obscure as to the where, the when and the wherefore. However, in the coming of Jesus, all was now revealed. Those ancient promises could have had no other end in view than Jesus. And all this was just as God had commanded, as the Apostle says. It was no afterthought. It was what had been lovingly planned by God from the beginning. He was in control, and he had now intervened just as he had promised time and again. Indeed, Paul implies that since this was so, oh, once the day arrived, it was the prophets who were making known the message about Jesus. 
In other words, now that Jesus had come, the testimonies of those who had preceded his coming revealed clearly who he was and what he had come to do. Paul is thus suggesting that he's really adding nothing to their witness. He may also be suggesting that we need to become students of the Old Testament. But Paul then adds two things here of vital importance to us. First of all, he reminds us that God's intervention in his world, an intervention that dealt with a global need, was a global message to, quote, all the Gentiles, end quote. Most Christian congregations will know that the Jews divided the world into two, them and the rest of the world whom they called the Gentiles. Here then Paul is saying that the message of the prophets was not an exclusive message, relevant merely to one group of people, but a clarion call that extends to every nation and people group and to every group within them. Simply put, a cosmic problem has received a cosmic answer through the intervention of the Lord, who is the Lord of the cosmos. Small wonder then that Paul describes it as good news. But how then are we to respond to the revelation of God in his world, in his incarnate Son? Here Paul introduces a phrase that has already occurred in this letter in his introductory remarks in chapter 1 verse 5. He refers to the obedience of faith. This is clearly an all-embracing idea for Paul. It means that the entry into enjoying the blessings of a curse removed and renewed and lasting fellowship with God lies in submitting to his answer to human need. A recognition that there is no other answer than the one that Jesus himself supplies. But the words the obedience of faith also seem to imply a lifestyle. The entry point becomes a path, a path in which humble submission to God in Christ Jesus becomes our way of life. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. We simply cannot get around or beyond him and we must live with him, for him and empowered by his indwelling spirit. Paul's final words are telling. He says, To the only wise God be glory for ever through Jesus Christ. Amen. In these words that he sets before us, I suggest we find a threefold challenge. The first is the call to worshipfully acknowledge the awesome out of this world wisdom of our God who has conceived of such a plan to bring us home. The second is the reminder that our calling is now one that establishes his glory as the determining factor of all that we are and do. There can no longer be any justification for self to be on the throne. Day by day, we are called to humbly direct our lives according to his will, not ours. We aim for his glory. This is no easy task and one of which Paul does well to remind us uh, in the very face of the incarnation. But finally and thirdly, all this is always, as Paul says, through Jesus Christ. The Apostle began by saying his message was about Jesus Christ. Here he ends by saying everything about that good news is through Jesus Christ. The personal experience of the good news is only accessible to us through him. I think we must applaud the compilers of our lectionary for nominating this epistle passage for the Sunday before Christmas. No verses could more clearly direct our thoughts to why the coming of the Lord Jesus is to be celebrated. He is the one promised for ages, the answer to the dire human condition. 
he reveals the tender mercies of God's inexpressible wisdom as God incarnate to turn away the divine wrath and restore our fellowship with himself. No passage could more clearly set before us the personal challenge to be found in Christ and to live to the glory of God. No scripture can more effectively arouse us to the obedient worship of all that we are than this mystery that is now revealed.